Are you real? Dude, I, I think I am. So that's actually some pretty solid evidence. Rene Descartes. I can't tell you how much time I've spent contemplating the fact that every morning I wake up as me and not as someone else. That's because you're not in the quantum leap. <laughs> In today's video, we're doing another look at Neil deGrasse Tyson's conversation with Chuck Nice, Gary O'Reilly, and Anil Seth as they talk about consciousness. I've done another video on this. I think it's a fascinating conversation, and you can find the entire video at Star Talk. Uh, the title of it is Neil and Anil Seth Discuss Consciousness and the Universe. Um, today, they're focusing in a little bit more on you know, why are you, you? And if, you know, the, you know, the, the consciousness problem in general, and, and they go into touch on whether or not animals are consciousness. Anyway, I, I think it's really fascinating. I'm going to have some opinions that I'll add as we go. And then I want to know what you think in the comments, but let's check it out together. What is the difference between the function of, or, or something that functions like consciousness and what we feel, because let's be honest, it's the true knowing that we have. Yeah, you know, consciousness for individuals is this like very visceral and intense knowing. And we, if we cannot ascribe that to something else, then we say it's not conscious. But yet there are things that function as consciousness, like tree root networks. It allows the trees to literally talk to one another and, and I need more water and that tree gets more water or, you know, uh, I need to fight off this particular fungi. Like, and that is a kind of knowing, but we won't say they're conscious. We'll just say that's a function. So where do you find the balance and difference to make that differentiation? Yeah, it's, it's a really tricky um, tightrope to walk because, you know, on the one hand, we have to use human way of being as a kind of benchmark because we know that we are conscious and, and that's that's a starting point if you like but we don't want to be too again anthropocentric and, and see everything through this through this human lens and not every function is going to need consciousness now, i'm a sort of mm -hmm. materialist so i like, like to think of, of consciousness as a biological property that that arose in evolution gradually um but to perform certain functions, to enable certain functions in creatures where it was useful. And so we have to ask, well, what does consciousness do for us and where might it be in the rest of, of biology then? And again, there's lots of different answers to this, but consciousness for us seems to bring like a, a ton of information together in this kind of unified way. So you said, you know, we know, we have this sense of knowing, and that seems to be this kind of thing. You open your eyes in the morning and there's a whole unified world out there and you can just experience everything going on around you your alarm clock smell of coffee whatever it is you experience your body and you experience you know, what you might do next i can't tell you how much time i've spent contemplating the fact that every morning i wake up as me and not as someone else that's because you're not in the quantum leap <laughs> okay <laughs> All right, I'm in the wrong show. You're in the wrong <laughs> show, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> get out of here. Well, why, why would you? Why would you expect to be someone else when you woke up? It's not that I expect to be. I just wonder why I'm not. It's not a matter of expectations. It's there's eight billion people in the world. Why am I persistently me? What is it about me that makes me me every day I wake up? But the other the other possibility is, in fact, you're you're overestimating the extent to which you remain you from day to day you know it's it's, it's like Ooh, if you think about yeah you're not you but you're not you neil <laughs> you're not you man <laughs> neil, i need further explanation on that sentence <laughs> but just think about neil deGrasse Tyson at the age of 10 or something you know is, is that yes. really the same person well i have memories from that age, from that age i have memories but our experiences will alter us if you like, microscopically, to the point where a decade later, we aren't quite that same person. No, no, I, I get that. But I have the same memories of mm -hmm. events that occurred. Well, you think you do. But actually, the more often you, you recall something, the less accurate that memory is. That's what they say. But I work hard to avoid that. So you, we can wear a memory out. 
Is that what you're saying? You experience it differently when you remember it, and then you remember mm. it again, and you experience it differently when you remember it. And so every time a cell makes a copy of itself, it's, you know, not the best cell. <laughs> <laughs> it might be slight. This is really uh, interesting, but, you know, uh, one thing that chimes with me, and I, this isn't a fundamentally political conversation, but one thing that chimes with me is during the Me Too movement, what a common refrain it was to hear people often accused abusers say, well, you know, I remember it differently. And I'm not saying that that is an excuse for behavior, but uh, by its very nature, these guys seem to be saying is, is memory does reinforce itself differently. It changes over time. And the act of remembering something multiple times actively sort of evolves that memory. I think it's fascinating. A little cell. different. It might be slightly better. So well, it could be better. a better cell. Yeah. It could yeah. somebody be slightly worse. As they say, there are two primary failures of memory. One of them is you remember things that never happened. And the other one is you don't remember things that did. And I don't claim to remember everything in my life. But what I do remember, I remember with pretty high precision. And you forgot the third, which is you remember that a black man did it. <laughs> What's <laughs> in the police lineup? Yeah. <laughs> but I just want to re return to what Gary said because he's absolutely right that the thing is, if there's a there's a phenomenon in perception called change blindness, one way change blindness can happen is that if something changes very slowly, then we don't perceive the change. Our perception can change, but we don't experience the change of perception. Something like that might well be happening with the self. So our, our experience of self is changing just a little bit day by day, but because it changes so slowly, we never experience ourselves as changing or, or, or we do so only when we compare it like, oh, what was I like 10 years ago, 20 years ago? And then we think, ah, I'm actually maybe quite different. Okay. So therapists are paid a lot of money to speed up that process. Well, I think mm. they can, <laughs> I mean, they can certainly, that's one way of thinking about it. They can certainly bring out aspects that we have forgotten to point out how different we are, how different we can be as well. Why else go to a therapist unless there's something you want to change? That's right. There's a potential for change. I think speed up may be not the best term because, you know, they certainly want you to reveal things about yourself to yourself. But, you know, the longer it takes, <laughs> the better it is. <laughs> You know, more billing you know, cycles. That's all I'm saying. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anil, what Chuck was saying about the tree, if we kind of roll that out. Are you referring to the, the mycelium, the network, the fungal network? Yeah, but just among. taking the fact that we roll that out from tree to table and we say, isn't it panpsychism that's basically, and I'll, I'll be very basic with this because that's all I can be, that there's a consciousness inferred to everything? Can you, uh, for, for my sake, please, because I've heard the term panpsychism and I've even looked it up and I, I still don't get the whole concept. Is it that consciousness is derived from everything? Consciousness is inferred upon everything or something in between? I'm, I'm no, I too have heard the word, but I've never looked it up. It just sounds kind of new agey to me. That's all. But I want okay. to get official. Yeah, where does Anil stand on this? What, what is it? Well, I, I, <clears throat> I'm not a fan of it, but it is a well-established philosophical position. And it is that consciousness, it's not just inferred everywhere. It, it is fundamental. It's something of equivalent status to mass energy or electrical charge. It is a fundamental aspect of the universe in which we live. So it's not saying that a table is conscious or a tree is conscious. Right. Okay. It's just that consciousness exists at the most fundamental level of things. And then certain things like human beings exhibit consciousness at this other level too, of, of a whole organism. But a table wouldn't. A table is made of things that are individually a little bit conscious, but there's no consciousness that inheres to the table itself. And I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'll, that's what it is. For me, it doesn't really help. Okay, what you just said is why Chuck could read the explanation and still not know what the hell it is. Because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if that's your best explanation for that word, we need some work on that. 
<laughs> well, Anil said he wasn't a big fan anyway, so he's probably going to want to throw it under the bus. What's, but what's wrong with it? I mean, consciousness is fundamental and everywhere. That's reasonable, isn't right. it? Yeah. As long as I'm conscious, it's reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what everywhere means. I guess that's my, my big question. Well, you know, in the same way that, that mass is basically pretty much everywhere, electrical charge is pretty much everywhere. The, these are things that, are, that they don't have lower, le lower levels. Wait, so, so consciousness is on the moon? I mean, I, I'm trying to understand. The universe is large, yeah. and life is only on Earth. Yeah. And panpsychism is trying to declare that consciousness permeates the universe? Basically, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the only way you can look at it from what you just said, Anil, is that, uh, it, that it's a kind of um, connective pressure that is... Hmm a force acting upon us all, whether or not you're aware of it or not. So a table is not aware of that force, but it's a part of that force. And maybe it's that that allows us to interact with the table through our consciousness. From my readings, it's, uh, Rupert Sheldrake is a fan of this, if memory serves. Is that correct? You know, I'm not entirely sure. I had a, had a long... I had about an eight hour train journey with Rupert Sheldrake last year. So this, this should Ooh. be clear to me, but he's certainly oh, of the, come view on, that, spill the that, tea. That That's the British train system for is, you. Uh, this was in Norway. <laughs> um, <laughs> in Britain, it would have been 24 hours. Um, in, yeah. Well, you go. So certainly he's of the view that everything that consciousness is everywhere that life is. You know, life and consciousness are very closely tied. In that, I kind of agree with him that there's an intimate connection between life and consciousness. I probably would put it in a, in a slightly different way that for me, not everything that is alive is consciousness. But I certainly think that being alive is critical to being conscious. And, you know, I've read that some people want to think of consciousness as extending beyond self as a shared sort of consciousness field out there. Now, I'm, I'm always one for a fun idea, a fun new idea about how the universe works. But in the physical sciences, we put very high currency on testability of an idea, not just whether it sounds good to an audience. And so are there people testing panpsychism in a way that would give it some teeth here? Because you, in your role, are skeptical of it. Yeah, well, panpsychism itself can't be tested. That's one, one problem with it, but it's a problem with all philosophical positions. It's just a way of thinking about what consciousness, how it fits into the universe. So that, okay. can't, but the, okay. the idea that you had about does consciousness sort of extend beyond the body? Can it be something that interacts with, with other things, you know, in, in some kind of field that goes out beyond the brain? That can be tested. I mean, people have tried to test these sorts of things all the time, extrasensory perception, telepathy, all of these sorts of things. And none of them have stood up when they've been tested rigorously in the face of, of you know, hard evidence. You know, uh, I'm going to I'm going to end this one here. I'm definitely going to do another video on this. I think it's so fascinating. One of the things that um one of the things that I love about Neil deGrasse Tyson, his channel, Star Talk, uh but but also um listening to scientists talk about these complex things, religion, consciousness, things that that have a strong philosophical bent to them is scientists are never afraid to admit when they don't know something. They're not afraid of, of admitting not that there are limits to what they know and that the answers can change based on the data that they have. And one of the things that I find so infuriating about <laughs> politics, I know I'm doing a political channel, uh, is just that, you know, you constantly hear from the right and uh, Trump in particular these days, that they are the expert on everything that they know and this is how it is. And, you know, some of it is so flagrantly baloney, but others is just half-truth uh, declaimed as this solid th known thing. And it's a lie. You know, you're never going to hear these people take responsibility. You're never going to hear them admit that they're wrong or they don't know. And um, And so I think listening to scientists talk about stuff um, is, is always refreshing in that way. But I want to know what you think in the comments.